Welcome to another episode of Bite Size Learning with MDSA. My name is Divya Shri Ramlu. I'm the Academic and Research Officer of Malaysian Dental Students Association for the 2019 and 2020 tenure. Bite Size Learning with MDSA is a new series of short, concise academic videos whereby we invite experts to cover clinical related topics and some common questions or challenges that students or dentists may face in their clinics. Today we have with us a special guest, Dr. Rose Thomas. Dr. Rose has completed her master's in endodontology and currently a senior clinical teacher at the University of Central Lancashire, United Kingdom. She also runs her private practice, Thomas and Thomas Dental Associates. Welcome doctor and thank you for being here. Thanks Devia for inviting me towards this. It's a pleasure to be with you all. For today's episode, we have an important topic to discuss. It is one of the most crucial steps before starting root canal treatment. Our topic today is endodontic diagnosis. In this episode, Dr. Rose will be getting into the depth of endodontic diagnosis, followed by a few clinical scenarios. With that, I'll pass on the floor to you, Doctor. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to Divya for inviting me for this lecture. Today, we are going to focus on the endodontic diagnosis um, uh, terminology. Uh, endodontic diagnosis terms, uh, what we use at the University of Central Lancashire is based uh, on the AAE uh, guidelines. Uh, and uh, having a particular diagnostic term uh, or a diagnosis helps us to determine what clinical treatment is required for a particular tooth. And it helps to communicate between patients and dentists, between dentists and also with other dental health professionals. It is an art of distinguishing one disease from another. and um, it helps uh, for us to come to a particular diagnosis in a way that uh, we can uh, give a treatment plan to a patient so that they can make an informed decision on what treatment, uh, what they need or what uh, they want to go ahead with. It is essential that uh, we make the diagnosis based on the diagnostic tests uh, and the radiographic findings and documented clearly in the patient's records uh, so that it helps to avoid litigation. And at the same time, it's helpful for yourself uh, to know at a later date why or just how you justify your own treatment plan or why you go, went ahead with the particular treatment. So there will be situations where a definitive diagnosis cannot be made uh, when the clinical um, tests and radiographic findings are inconclusive or in a case where they're giving conflicting results. Uh, in such a situation, uh, a treatment should not be started. So it might be that you, you will have to uh, reassess the patient at later date in a way that uh, you can get to a definitive diagnosis before you start a treatment, uh, especially root canal treatment on a particular tooth. So, uh, in this um, slide, I'm talking about how um, the process of getting to a diagnosis. Uh, I could probably explain it like a, a puzzle where you can get the different pieces of information together to come uh, to bring, uh, bring out the diagnosis. So you cannot make a diagnosis with a single piece of information, but the patient has got all the information with them. So it's about uh, trying to get all the information out of the patient in a systematic uh, way. So you gather all the information put together so then uh, it makes sense to you how uh, you came to that you, you come out to the diagnosis so um for being a, a, a diagnostician you need to develop the skills uh, the skills uh, the main ones are the knowledge training patients uh, the art of listening and uh, most of all common sense as well so knowledge is mainly um uh, it's about full understanding of all the information you gather to come to the diagnosis. So, and also uh, with that, the process of the ability to make a treatment plan uh, to come to do the treatment and also evaluate the treatment as well as the prognosis of the tooth. And with experience, uh, this gets better. Uh, you become excellent diagnostician, but uh, the main thing I would say is approaching it systematically. So getting all the information systematically from the patient in a way that you can put it together. Um, in cases where if you've come to an incorrect assessment, it could lead to an incorrect treatment plan. So sometimes it can lead to having a root canal treatment on a tooth which does not need one, or sometimes a tooth which needs a root filling and with other treatment uh, whatever, uh, which was not required at that point of time. So uh, when you talk to a patient, so when a patient comes with a chief complaint, 
so uh, in the dentist's mind so when the dentist start taking the medical and dental history you will have start making a prelimi preliminary uh, diagnosis in his or her own mind um, and by the time it comes to the clinical examination and uh, clinical tests and the radiographical findings all these complement to that preliminary diagnosis in your mind and eventually uh, bring it out to a definitive diagnosis so so when you're talking to a patient about uh, their medical or dental history so it, sometimes it could have been because of a, a recent treatment the patient might have had a, a recent filling a deep filling on a tooth uh, probably it is uh, then you sort of start thinking did it start after the after that uh, appointment or you know so there are so many things which will come to your mind uh, so you need to talk about and also the some of sometimes it could be the drugs the patient is taking so then in your mind you start thinking or maybe uh, if the patient is on uh, bisphosphonate therapy or uh, a, a case where the patient has got an increased risk of having um, yeah, if, if the patient loses the tooth the patient's got a, a, uh, an increased risk so probably in your mind you'll be thinking oh this patient needs to be saving this tooth so these are the things which will start coming into your mind when you start uh, the process of taking the medical and dental history so you're coming to the chief complaint you'll be talking about how long uh, the problem has been and how severe the symptoms are and are they taking any pain relief and whether they can locate it they can point to the truth so all these things will give you more and more information so you're systematically gathering that, that that information to bring it all together so then it comes to the clinical examination so if the patient can point to the truth and giving the history of where this is coming from or any history of treatment on this tooth then otherwise as well you'll be doing a full examination uh, in the soft tissue examination asymmetry swelling um, and uh, if there's any sinus tract um, uh, related to that tooth um, mobility, probing, uh, pulp, um, um, and if there's any caries or um, a restoration which is leaking, uh, all these things will give you more and more information uh, towards that diagnosis. So next comes the clinical testing, where the you sort of like, this, this is where you sort of uh, get the pulpal and the periapical diagnosis. So the pulpal tests give you the status of the of the pul pulpal status of the tooth for that pulpal diagnosis and periapical tests such as the percussion and palpation test uh, guide you to the pulp the periapical diagnosis as well. So the pulpal test includes the thermal test, which are the cold and the heat test, uh, or, or the electric pulp test as well. So many of the time, I I my first go is the cold test uh, with endofrost. So if it gives me con consistent readings, then probably I may not go to anything else. If it is inconsistent, I'll get my electric pulp tester. And the periapical tests include the percussion test, palpation test. And in, in some cases, if there's a, um, um, you know, signs of fracture or um, uh, crack tooth syndrome uh, signs, then probably you'll use a tooth sleuth as well. Radiographic analysis is mainly by periapical radiographs. Uh, sometimes you need a second radiograph to see the morphology of the multi of a multi rooted tooth or the lesion, and and in some cases you may need a CBCT as well to get the three dimensional view of what's happening. And some additional tests are tans elimination, uh, which will be useful many of the time in a cracked tooth. And also selective anas uh, anesthesia is when a patient cannot locate where the tooth is coming from between the arches, uh, so you could use that. And again, test cavity is mentioned as one of the additional tests, but I haven't personally used it, but I always feel that it is a bit brutal. Uh, I might ask the patient uh, to come back for a reassessment uh, to go through the whole test again uh, to see if I can come to a definitive diagnosis. Um, doctor, I just have one question uh, yeah. uh, for this slide. Uh, what is selective anesthesia and test cavity? So selective anesthesia is when um, the patient uh, uh, comes in uh, where they cannot locate which, where the pain's coming from. So many of the time they'll say it's from the left-hand side. Uh, I don't know which tooth it is. I can't. I can't even tell which, if it's top or bottom. And, you know, so in such situations, you probably, uh, uh, you will be doing all the tests before even, this is almost like the last uh, uh, resort uh, because many of the time before even you get there, you would have got the diagnosis, but this is sort of like the last uh, uh, resort uh, where if you can't, cannot um, uh, say where the pain is coming from, or you cannot diagnose uh, where exactly which tooth is the cost problematic one. So, in such, such a situation, you would probably uh, do all the pulp tests and whatnot, and then you might 
then with the radiographic finding or you might there might be an obvious tooth which has got an extensive filling or uh, whatever so it might be a lower left six and an upper left six so you wouldn't know if it is a lower left six or the upper left six so in such situation if you uh, give an id block and numb up the low, lower arch so that's uh, you know you anesthetize the lower arch so it is probably then then you can do the if the patient still have the pain uh, after the lower arch is numb then you sort of like you know you sort you so, it sort of like get you more towards the diagnosis so that, that's sort of like synective uh, anesthesia uh to be honest i haven't honestly used uh, that technique yet uh, um, but many of the time if it's not that conclusive i have had patients where i had to reassess them after a few days uh, i asked them to take painkillers and come back uh, and many of the time it will be um then it, it will give you a proper diagnosis as well be localized uh, test cavity is uh again you know going into a tooth without even anesthetizing so well that's brutal oh. uh, so uh, to see if uh, the patient can feel it if it's a non-vital tooth so well I, I haven't used that either so but you know these are the additional tests uh, which are available um, and they say uh, you know which probably you could use but yeah uh, i don't i don't use them regularly all right i understand doctor so in this slide, it's sort of like, this is exactly what I was talking about, we'll, uh, how we come uh, down through, from uh, the whole process where we take the history, dental and medical, uh, comes through the clinical examination, the results of the objective testing and the radiographs, the result, and then that's when you come to a definitive diagnosis. And from there, you plan uh, what treatment the patient is going to have, and you discuss with the patient so that they can come to an informed uh, decision on what treatment they would like to go ahead with. So with the endodontic diagnostic terms as per the AAE, uh, you must include a palpal and periapical uh, diagnostic like, terms uh, for that particular tooth. So uh, let's talk about the palpal diagnosis first. So for a normal pulp, um, it is how uh, it would respond normally. It's usually symptom-free. All the signs uh, are, uh, clinical signs are within normal limits. Normally it's responsive to pulp testing uh, in normal limits. So uh, in case of reversible pulpitis, many of the time it's based on against objective uh, and subjective findings. So the patient will be complaining of sensitivity uh, many of the time with mild discomfort, uh, with cold, sometimes sweet stimuli. It will be of short duration and maybe they might say that it doesn't last for a long time and they, are not, they may not be taking painkillers for it as well. So uh, you do the clinical test with the thermal tests uh, initially and uh, many of the time it, uh, you will find that there won't be any radiographic changes as well so with the clinical tests um, um, the response will be of very short duration it wouldn't last uh, more than a couple of seconds following the uh, remote of stimulus as well so many of the time you'll find that this is because of caries so uh, you'll just treat the caries sometimes it can be uh, uh, due to tendon sensitivity as well, where you would use uh, desensitizers and things like that to try and help uh, to reverse the situation. Uh, the next one we're talking about is symptomatic uh, irreversible pulpitis. So it is again uh, based on subjective and objective finding. So here the pain will last even after you remove the uh, stimulus from the tooth. So after the clinical test, sometimes you may have to numb the tooth uh, to get rid of the pain for the patient. So uh, that sort of indicates that the tooth is uh, irreversibly damaged. And um, many of the time the patient will say that uh, they have not been sleeping at night and it's unprovoked and lingering sort of pain. Uh, the radiographs may or may not show radiographic findings. It depends on whether inflammation have has reached the periapical tissues. So it could be uh, tended to percussion. Um, uh, it may not be either as well. And radiographic findings as well, it's pretty much similar. It could uh, show some widening of the periodontal ligament space or a condensing ostitis, uh, which is like a thickening or um, radio opacity around the apex of the root, um, which uh, I have, I have got a slide in, in, one, in one of the coming slides. There's one of the radiographs that shows how the condensing ostitis looks as well. So that could be um, seen as well in, in some cases. Asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis is again, as the term says, uh, the patient will be asymptomatic. Uh, there won't be any clinical symptoms or pain. It's again, based on subjective and objective finding. Uh, the peripheral radiograph uh, may not show um, a particular finding, uh, it, it will be within normal limits as well. And uh, many of the time it will be like there, there might be a deep caries or a trauma where uh, it will, it is that by the time you remove the whole of the caries, it is 
in the pulp or that you're going to expose the pulp. Pulp necrosis is when a tooth is non-vital, that uh, it could be symptomatic or asymptomatic, um, and it will be non-responsive uh, to thermal tests. So, you know, which where uh, sometimes you may need uh, another, uh, like another test to, so if, if it is negative to the thermal test, you may need the electric pulp tester as well, just to double check uh, that you got uh, the right diagnosis uh, for the palpable status of that tooth. Uh, and sometimes you'll find that the tooth may be discolored and may or may not be discolored as well. The next one is a previously treated tooth. Uh, this is mainly when the tooth is previously root canal treated. So this is this will be coming from the patient's history. The patient will be saying that, oh, I had it root filled so many years ago and started giving me problems. Or uh, And the radiographic findings will tell you as well. And you, you are, you're not expecting the tooth to respond to any uh, thermal tests. Previously initiated therapy is slightly different to the previously treated. It's mainly that it is only initiated, it's not completed. So many of the time you'll find it when the tooth has been symptomatic and they've been to a dentist or emergency dentist. So, uh, so they have opened up and uh, extirpated the pulp and dressed the tooth. So, but many of the time you see the patient uh, that might be asymptomatic. It could be symptomatic or asymptomatic, but the radiographic finding and patient's history. Uh, so. Uh, will tell you that it was initiated and the radiographic finding you'll find there might be uh, some um, dress filling material in the pulp chamber space. The next one, um, periapical diagnosis. Uh, uh, there are again six periapical diagnostic terminology. Normal apical tissues is when um, the, the tooth is with the normal li uh, limits, the radiographically, the lamina dura will be intact, and uh, there's uniform periodontal ligament space uh, around the uh, around the uh, root as well. The, it won't be sensitive to percussion or palpation. So it's the periodical diagnosis is mainly based on the percussion and palpation tests. So. Um, uh, with the symptomatic epical periodontitis, it's mainly if it is symptomatic to the percussion test and the palpation test, then it is symptomatic epical periodontitis. So it, it doesn't necessarily need to have uh, a radiographic finding of uh, a pathology. So it may or may not be accompanied by radiographic changes, but it will be uh, mainly uh, your clinical um, test uh, finding, which tell you whether it is symptomatic uh, epical periodontitis. So uh, at the same time, asymptomatic is again the same way. Um, um, the, there won't be any clinical symptoms. It won't be tended to percussion or there won't be buccalateral um, palpation tenderness or uh, on this tooth. But um, a radiograph um, shows there's an epical pathology. So it is uh, something you can see on this radiograph. There is, on the upper left seven, there's an uh, there's a radiolucent area. This tooth was in, uh, this was re, this tooth was referred to me for retreatment, uh, sort root canal treatment of the upper left seven. And so uh, this so for the diagnosis for this pulp pill, it will be a previously initiated therapy because you can see the um, uh, there is uh, there is filling material in the bulk chamber space, but it wasn't tended to percussion or there was no buckle tenderness to palpation so it is an asymptomatic epigabinoiditis in this situation as a periapical diagnosis for this patient um the next one is acute apical abscess so when you're talking about abscess there's you know pus swelling so there'll be extreme tenderness to pressure uh you know patient come up uh, many of the time they come with uh, pus formation swelling um, is fever, lymphadenopathy, uh, all these can be uh, one of the symptoms the patient is presented with. So the radiographic findings could either be with or without, uh, depending on um, how chronic the symptom is. So sometimes it can be acute exacerbation uh, of a chronic problem, or it could be an acute problem as well. But uh, if the patient presents with swelling um, and malaise fever, lymphadenopathy, sometimes, you know, in a case where you may prescribe antibiotics uh, along with uh, uh, the open address uh, of the tooth, then uh, that is an acute epical abscess. Coming to chronic epical abscess to differentiate between acute, so this is a chronic problem, it's a, of gradual onset. And again, it's suppuration that is intermittent discharge of pus uh, through a sinus tract. Um, and many of the time, there won't be much of a discomfort for the patient. They might say that, oh, there's a boil next to the tooth that just comes and goes and drains. So you can see a picture, um, photo, intraoral photograph of uh, lower left six, seven, where there's two um, buccal sinus tracts. And so this is, uh, so some, many of the time, there can be a, 
a bit of a confusion when a tooth is symptomatic, like, you know, the it is tended to pressure, tended to uh, percussion and there's a tendency to palpation and also there's a buccal uh, sinus. So in such a situation, if there's a buccal sinus, it supersedes the symptomatic epical varonitis and you, the your diagnostic term comes to be chronic epical abscess. The last one is the condensing osteitis. So this is a radiograph which shows uh, how a condensing osteitis looks like. So it is a diffuse radioopaque lesion at the root of the apex. So it represents a localized bony reaction uh, to a low-grade inflammatory stimulus. So, uh, so uh, sometimes it could, could be seen in patients who are presented with irreversible uh, pulpitis symptoms as well. So I got some uh, clinical case scenarios to go through, uh, which would help you to just practice uh, some of these diagnostic terms. The first case.